Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 29 of the Future of Work show. Now, for those of you who've been following us for a while, we have this conversation most weeks, and we've covered a very wide range of conversations, right from what does it mean to build innovative organizations? What does it mean to build liquid organizations? What does it mean to incorporate design thinking into the culture of the organization? And then, of course, we've also had several conversations around integrating technology into the workplace. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the work we do, uh, we have been doing a lot of leadership talks with senior teams. And if you and your organization are also interested in understanding what lies ahead for you around the future of work, do reach out for us. I'm the founder of Uncube, an education and advisory firm specifically focused on the future of work. And my partners in crime are Jaspreet Bindra, who focuses on business and technology, and Papia Banerjee, who works with talent and leadership. Now, with that, the topic for the day. Uh, there are few topics that get everybody as interested as the topic of compensation. And I have with me just the right person to try and understand what the future of compensation holds for us. I'm just going to bring my guest on. Hi, Sam. Welcome to the show. Hi, Shalini. So a little bit about Sam. Sam is a managing director at Willis Towers Watson. And he used to lead the compensation and rewards team for India, but now is in a global leadership role. He's also the author of an article which he writes annually, uh, speaking to the top five trends of compensation of that year. And that's really how I became aware of the work that Sam does. And I was really excited about the kind of predictions he was making and therefore just absolutely had to have him on the show. So Sam, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy you were able to make time for this. Uh, you bring with you an expertise that is really one that all of us are curious about. I think uh, while we've had many conversations around the kinds of organizations we're building, but the one topic that gets everybody most interested is in fact compensation and rewards, your topic. Thank you, Shalini. It's a pleasure to be on your show. So Sam, uh, I know that Willis Towers Watson just very recently came out with compensation trends for 21. And just before we dive into the future of compensation, which is, of course, a much larger subject, do you want to share the top headline items from that report? So I think, uh, you know, we just came up with our salary increase uh, uh, survey for uh, India and around the world. Uh, and in fact, I think 2021 definitely seems uh, to start on a positive note uh, if you're an employee in the company. I think if you remember last year, the pandemic just hit us in about March in India uh, and, and, you know, a little bit ahead in China and some of the other East Asian countries. Um, but I think a lot of companies around, I, I would say about more than 50 percent in India froze the salary increases last year. Uh, there was a lot of conscious environment. Uh, you know, employers were uh, in 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 a zone of conservation of capital. Uh, but I think from the early survey that we look at, I think twenty twenty one definitely seems to be that almost eighty five percent companies are going to be giving a salary increase this year. Uh, although I think that days of ten percent increases in India are gone now. I think it's more around the six point eight seven percent mark. Uh, but key point to note is that it it really is about the affordability of your company. So, you know, we can predict whatever we can uh, basis the surveys that we run. But I think it's about the company. Uh, how much can you afford in terms of giving a salary increase? Uh, how did the pandemic impact your industry? You know, I, I'm, I'm sure travel or hospitality industries got more impacted than some of the high tech or pharma companies. And uh, you you would association there in terms of the talent trends. It's very important to look at from a segmentation perspective. You know your high performers versus your average performers. So really looking at this six point six percent, it should not be that it's for everyone. It it is the company budget, 
uh, and then it gets spread out uh, you know depending on the affordability depending on uh, depending on the talent segment uh, depending on um, uh, you know other uh, looking, looking from a, a total rewards perspective right right no uh, so from what you say i understand that employees should expect compensation to more or less keep track of inflation if their organization has the you know budget for it well i wouldn't just say inflation i i think inflation uh, again you can google you can find what the best number for inflation is you know there is something that's published or something you know other companies would publish i would think it's more that you should expect a salary increase based on what is the market rate for your particular job uh, right and based on th those benchmarks based on how much impact that you um, have your job has been able to make on the organization itself you know as an individual uh, how much contribution were you able to make within that organization so if the revenues that you as an individual at any level have made an impact which is significantly higher than your competitors uh, versus the cost uh, base is lower so you know you you're increasing the profit margin and hence your cost can go up based on the salary increases so it's not just about the inflation because i feel inflation is uh, you know it has been you know it's it's a 20 30 year old concept that you should give increases based on inflation uh, it's more now about Uh, the impact that you are able to make uh, on the top line and the bottom line of the organization okay i think i'm beginning to understand but i'm going to ask you more questions around that sam so obviously last year was was a year unlike any other and uh, i'm wondering what you think have been the consequences of last year and in fact the fact that many organizations are considering returning to work in a very different form you know some form of hybrid uh, do you think that that has any bearings on compensation the different year for um, everyone uh, i think all of us got impacted in some shape and form and i think uh, compensation professionals reward professionals work in the same fashion uh, i think when the dynamics getting at Um, for the insurance policies, you know, we uh, employees impacted. A lot of companies started to look at what should be, uh, you know, are my comp are my uh, are my insurance policies enough to cover uh, my employees? I, I think there was a lot of, you know, I think organizations have done a fantastic job in taking care of employees. I think. So I think Sam has just dropped off. I think there were some connectivity issues. I'm just going to get him back. I think the sound was breaking up. Got them. Thanks. I I wasn't sure whether that was completely at my end. Uh, let me just bring him back. You know, thanks for all your patience. Sometime. Uh, sometimes we ourselves are surprised at the kinds of challenges we have 
Uh, Shalin, can you hear me? Yeah, Sam, we uh, we can hear you very clearly now. For some reason, in between, uh, you know, your voice broke up a lot. So we're getting a lot of comments that you know people couldn't hear you very well. So is it all right if I ask you to repeat what you spoke about on you know the impact of the pandemic on compensation? Sorry about that. No, no, no problem. I think this is what technology uh, makes us happen, and, and that is what I was talking about. I think the impact of uh, compensation, or you know, the impact that pandemic had on compensation. Uh, you know, I think at the beginning, a lot of the comp professionals started looking at their insurance policies. Firstly, uh, to begin with, that can we make sure that all our employees are covered with regards to COVID? Uh, I, I think companies have done a fantastic job of really taking care of employees. Uh, that was the primary focus. Uh, there was also the focus of how can we conserve our cash and, uh, you know, companies tried and make sure their best that they don't impact employees. But there were a lot of the temporary cuts. Uh, there was yeah. not that many headcount cuts, but there were a lot of the temp cuts. And as I spoke about that, you know, more than 50% companies didn't give a salary increase. They, they did actually do a little bit of uh, temporary cuts on the pay. Um, I think the reward professionals were really looking at what is the best optimized way in terms of their return on uh, compensation cost. They were, uh, you know, we were trying to differentiate between our frontline workers and those that were working from home. Uh, we were trying to also look at things which, uh, you know, as, as, as the pandemic happened, we all moved from work to home, like in a flash, right? And there was a lot of demand of companies, you know, who have not, who've been in a very traditional setup. Uh, you know, how do you move into cloud? How do you move into all this digital setup? Uh, and there was a spurge in those kind of skill sets and demand and companies started to hire freelancers, uh, started to hire some of those skill sets and then started paying whatever that was required. Uh, so I, I, you know, I think there was definitely HR and comp was in the thick of action to try and uh, work with employees uh, to communicate and, and, and really able to uh, get the impact of uh, affordability the impact of how the revenues if are stalled how can we um, you know continue to pay the same amount so uh, definitely there was a lot of thick of action the whole uh, employee well-being and uh, taking care of employees became uh, the primary purpose no i i think um, i would concur that is exactly what we've also observed with all the organizations who we've interacted with and worked with I think uh, HR leaders and business leaders uh, through last year have really tried their best to protect jobs as much as possible. And in most organizations, obviously, there are you know, exceptions. And uh, we've seen far more organizations uh, you know, give pay cuts or uh, maybe uh, delayed pay rises uh, than those who have laid off. I also like what you said about how suddenly, uh, you know, insurance became, uh, you know, an area of focus amongst many organizations to make sure that their employees were covered for the kind of uh, experiences that they went through last year. Uh, Sam, you briefly spoke about the fact that, uh, you know, uh, organizations pretty much overnight needed to work virtually. And I think that was an experience all over the world. In 2021, uh, a lot of organizations are thinking of going back, but in a hybrid model. Um, and of course, the hybrid works in many different ways. In some cases, the hybrid just means uh, working a certain number of days from an office location and other days uh, virtually. But in some organizations, the hybrid also might mean being able to hire talent um, you know, who can then work from locations which are not locations where they have important uh, you know office presences so do you see an impact of this uh, virtual work or hybrid model on the way compensation itself gets designed well I, I think that's a great question and a great point i think we will it will be very hard for most organizations to now just uh, go back to how it started right i 
I don't think the days yeah. where offices were designed for a nine to five cubicle yeah. kind of setup yeah. is going to yeah. happen. I think uh, a lot of the collaboration still needs to happen in the office, yeah. and I think a lot of all of us miss that uh, brainstorming with the team. There's nothing like whiteboarding uh, in yeah. front of them, and I think uh, offices will get restructured as more of collaborative spaces. Uh, I think you bring a very important point about talent. You know, most organizations were very restricted with talent based on where they were geographically based because we never had this kind of virtual setups that we now have been able to get accustomed to. Uh, and uh, there was also a lot of the cultural aspect of if if someone's working from home, are they really working, right? Um, but now I think the whole acceptability of working from home uh, and widens the whole talent pool. Uh, you know, if you have an office now in Gurgaon, uh, nothing stops you from hiring people in Pune and Bangalore and uh, Hyderabad. And, uh, you know, that option was not available before because the whole option was that you have to be where the work is. Um, and I think that will open up the talent market uh, a lot. Will that reduce uh, the, 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 the pricing of the job? I, you know, that's too early to see. Uh, you know, if, if I look at it from a pure economics perspective that, you know, the supply increases, then the demand, of course, uh, you know, the price should come down. But again, I think the critical skill sets will continue to be hot in demand. And I think that would continue to be there. I think the other important aspect of this is um, around the whole concept of paying based on where the work is. So yeah. now a lot of employees uh, are have moved back. Uh, you know, for example, someone working in Gurgaon was on rent uh, and now is in his hometown in Jaipur and is working from home. Uh, you know, of course, a lot better lifestyle, a lot better uh, being taken care of, does not have to deal with the rents in Gurgaon. Um, but is the salary justified to be paid in Gurgaon versus that you should be looking at it now from a cost of living perspective? Uh, I think early on uh, the trends that we are seeing that um, most companies will not be will not be reorganizing or thinking about that. Uh, but I, I do think there is an opportunity to restructure compensation. Um, in a lot of countries, there is, uh, you know, allowances and uh, benefits like company car, transport allowance, conveyance allowance. And those, when, when you're not going to office, doesn't make sense to have on uh, in, in terms of your whole compensation package. So I think that will need a relook at. Um, a lot of companies where, again, I come back to affordability, if they are not doing that well, they might also look at it from a perspective that can we pay based on where the person is based rather than where the office is. Uh, and that may have an impact. But I think overall, I think the availability and the movement of talent and augmenting full time talent with freelancers, with, uh, um, you know, RPAs, with, with, with technology is going to be a trend that we will continue to see in the future. Yeah, no, that's exactly what we're also seeing. I think the whole talent conversation has opened out and it's actually opened out at both ends. So on the one hand, it absolutely gives organizations the flexibility, as you said, if you're working in Gurgaon, it doesn't mean that you only need to you know, work with people who are located nearby. You now have the option of bringing people onto your team who could be located, frankly, anywhere uh, in the world even. Uh, and, uh, you know, we all, uh, this sort of coincides with the whole trend of flexible work arrangements of which full time employment, uh, the way we have, you know, seen in the past is only one format and multiple formats becoming more and more popular as we move ahead. And of course, this works the other way as well, that uh, it means that if you are the owner of skills or talents which are really in demand, then the number of potential organizations you can work with is much higher than it ever was a year ago because you know so it opens flexibility out at both ends talent becomes more flexible and organizations become more flexible and i think that's a very interesting trend to see it'll be interesting to see how this sort of uh, collides with the fact that historically 
uh, how much you got paid was impacted by which location you were working out of. And because now location becomes a much more flexible construct than it ever was before, it will be interesting to see how you know some of those uh, counter pulls get managed in organizations. Now, Sam, I want to pick up on a point that you spoke about just a while ago, uh, the fact that total wellness has become you know, a part of the conversation in a way that had never happened before 2020. How does total wellness impact compensation? Well, you know, as I mentioned, I, I think, um, you know, most companies, in fact, I would want to say all companies did a fantastic job of taking care of employees. Uh, and I think earlier this whole notion that, OK, you know what, I will get a 20 percent increase, 30 percent increase. I will move to another organization. I was never, uh, you know, had that vetted uh, feeling of, uh, of of being with the organization. But I think that definitely the pandemic has changed, and especially for people who got impacted more than the others. Uh, you know, just the fact that companies were warm enough uh, the teams were warm enough to take care of whatever needed to you know all the kids were work, kids were at home you know there was homeschooling happening uh, you know your parents were at home uh, your spouse was at home there was a lot of things that were going on in your home environment the work was going on uh, the flexibility that most managers teams gave them that you know it's it, you can work as long as the work gets done that is what's most important and we don't care how you are dealing with the uh, other aspects of your life. In fact, we were very empathetic. We were very sympathetic to the fact what you were going through. Uh, I think this, this whole thing has, the employees definitely have become a lot more loyal in, in some shape and form to the organization and have valued the purpose. Uh, you know, a lot of organizations also ran a lot of the uh, well-being programs, uh, you know, if, if you were sitting at home or every full full day on your desk, you know, there was a there was an exercise that would happen on a Friday as a team. You would do a yoga session or you would do a Pilates or you would do something. Uh, you know, there was mental well-being issues. You know, if you're not going out, you're sitting all alone and, you know, you don't. There are a lot of folks who are not living with the families, you know. They were just all alone sitting in front of their laptops and companies gave them a lot of support on mental uh, wellness, you know, speak, speak up, speak to your manager, speak to your friends. Um, uh, so, and, and also on the financial well-being, you know, are we saving enough, you know, are, is sitting at home and you're doing online and getting, uh, you know, rid of your cash. That's not the best strategy as well. So I feel that whole wellness has taken just from a physical well-being to mental well-being to uh, uh, to financial well-being uh, and and again the whole concept of total rewards is not just around compensation although we always feel that you know if i get a higher paid that's about it um, but i think the whole uh, benefits that the companies gave insurance benefits uh, with regards to uh, medical life um, with regards to your careers uh, so i think it's it's now a lot more holistic approach of total rewards and uh, companies really spent more time in looking at that whole wellness and uh, benefit piece where they did try and cut down on the compensation piece some of them did because of just the pure reason uh, to safeguard the interest that they didn't want to um, do the cuts uh, of employees and didn't want to take an action uh, you know, spontaneous action. They they just wanted the pandemic to uh, uh, get around. It's not still got around, but I think people have, uh, you know, at least been able to now manage it. It's been it's been almost a year, uh, so we are a lot. We are in a much better position to handle this situation than when we started off. And I think that has a whole different meaning to employees as well as employers uh, around uh, this this whole total rewards. Uh, kind of philosophy that it's not just about compensation at the end of the day. It's about how how uh, how the employer really takes care of me. That's such an interesting idea. I mean, we've always sort of known that, but it just never came under the compensation framework. And I like the fact that you speak about total rewards as a philosophy where 
the financial rewards are one aspect of it but many of the other softer issues like did you feel taken care of did you you know perhaps even whether your insurance was good enough or uh, you know what kind of wellness programs uh, were introduced by the organization mental health physical health and all of that forming part of your total rewards package. Now, um, do you think, Sam, this is a trend we're likely to see continue, or do you think this is very linked to COVID? Well, I think employees have a very short-term memory. So I think, unfortunately, that is uh, the matter of the fact that uh, uh, you know people will forget this. And if you are getting a 30 40% increase, you would definitely be considering those options. And, uh, the purpose-driven, the loyalty-driven aspect may go uh, go down. But I, I, from a company perspective, I, I do think this total rewards concept is going to be... Uh, uh, I, I think a lot of that... The, the whole Sorry, thing, Your voice is breaking up a little bit, so I'm just going to take you back to when you started speaking about come, employees have a short memory. Yeah, I was just saying employees have a really short uh, memory. So I think when you talked about that, is this a COVID phenomena? So I, I, I do feel that all this taking care and everything is, uh, you know, people forget as they start uh, going by uh, in, 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 in the normal life. But I do think from a company perspective, it's going to be very important to look at the whole concept of total rewards. It's not just about the compensation, it's about the total package, what you are spending on compensation, benefits, uh, on your um, employee well being, on uh, the whole part around allowances, uh, and um, also perquisites, uh, and, and then also that aspect of training, L&D, career, leadership, all of those, I mean, become part of that total rewards framework. And I do feel that is something that would be of, um, you know, a lot of interest to companies. Uh, I, I think the future will also be about more personalization. So it's not what is important to me. You know, I can be very passionate and say you know, what wellness was really important because I was really down and out and I really needed that. Uh, but for you, it might be that, you know, compensation was really important because you uh, did, did want the ends meet and, you know, your, uh, uh, your, your partner lost the job. Uh, so for you, compensation was more important. For me, wellness was more important. And how does this total rewards framework for companies become a personalized aspect uh, that can cater to your needs and my needs? And that is what the whole framework would be in the future. Uh, and and I think th this 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 needs to continue. Uh, it's an evolving kind of a framework where personalization will be very key. Now, I'm, and just hold that thought. I'm going to read some of the comments. I think uh, this is such an interesting conversation around what personalization will even mean. Uh, let's see what our viewers are saying. Uh, Omesh says, Harvard experts say some of our adaptations have accelerated already existing trends, like the development of a cashless society, the increase in remote work, the decline of brick and mortar retail, and they expect that some of these will become a more permanent part of the post-pandemic's new normal. Now, this is not exactly a compensation uh, question, but your views, your thoughts? Well, I, I think, again, I think this acceleration is great, right? I mean, this digital adoption and acceleration we've been looking for and talking about for years, uh, that this is going to happen. And I think as employees uh, are, are, are looking at it and I think are becoming more conversant and are becoming more savvy in this, I, I think for compensation and HR professionals, the thing to think about is how do we play a role in a virtual environment? HR is very personal. You know, it's it's the conversation between you and me and yeah. how I, I know your pulse uh, through emotions uh, and doing that on a virtual platform is tough. Uh, asking for help on a virtual platform is tough. Uh, and how do we take care of that and move now HR and comp and, and all those conversations into a virtual environment is what we will need to accelerate. But hopefully as as we have accelerated on that digital journey, we will accelerate in this one as well. 
Uh, no, thank you. Uh, Umesh and our own uh, perspective on this is you're absolutely right. I think many of the trends, uh, workplace trends, as, as, as well as cultural trends, have been accelerated by the whole pandemic. So we also don't expect uh, you know, the world to go back to where it was a year ago. Uh, I think many of the shifts are here to stay. Uh, of course, uh, what will be interesting is how they sort of now get integrated into a workplace that has the optionality of many more in-person uh, you know, meetings and conversations than was the case last year. So I think what we will see is a much more intelligent mix, I'm hoping, of virtual work and uh, you know, face-to-face -face collaborative work that's able to work to the strengths of each of the formats and each of the formats do have very, very distinct strengths. So I think some of that is here to stay. Gotham asks, uh, which raises a question in my mind, will organizations move to more permanent work from home policies and will part of that saving be passed through to employees? That's a great question, Gotham. And it's one, Sam, which I'm also curious about because you know many organizations are considering, for instance, downsizing uh, their office premises. So, uh, you know, moving to a smaller location because they are already envisaging a large number of their employees working remotely for at least a few days a week. Do you think part of those savings will be passed on to individuals, um, you know, in terms of home office infrastructure? Are you are you hearing any of those conversations? I mean. I understand you can't predict predict. I mean, every day, actually. I mean, this is a this is this is definitely a, a a common question that our clients are asking us is one is around the whole flexible policy. I think most companies are relooking and redesigning their flexible policies uh, to work from anywhere, work from home permanently, uh, and all of that. And I mean, it's 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 great for employees as well, right? I mean. Imagine the commute time that you save yeah. uh, on a daily basis. Uh, a lot of people might say, but I put in that much more hours on work and, you know, is work and life really getting balanced or it's getting more integrated or I'm working more than I was uh, before. So, I mean, I'm not getting my peace time. Uh, the whole question about our companies compensating for setting up the home infrastructure uh, I, I think some companies are uh, doing that. Uh, you know, you, you know, they are kind of compensating from, um, you know, giving you the bandwidth uh, allowances, uh, giving you, uh, you know, chairs uh, are being sent, uh, tables are being looked at. Um, you know, so I think companies, as I said, are looking into it uh, and have done quite a good job. But is that going to happen for all? No, I, I don't think it's not a one size fits all again boils down to my whole thing about affordability. If the industry is doing well, sure, you know, your company is doing well, they can afford it. Uh, the other part is that they could restructure some of these costs. So I talked about that, uh, you know, there is a conveyance allowance, right? Now, instead of the conveyance allowance, they could be a broadband allowance. And you could get that uh, instead of that conveyance allowance. So uh, it might get restructured. It's not that it's going to be a net addition to your compensation. Um, but but again, some companies may may be looking at that. Okay, fine, I, I can cut down on my real estate, uh, make it a more collaborative uh, uh, collaborative space, uh, and then maybe able to distribute uh, some of those savings as uh, additional allowances. Yes, I, I think companies are thinking that way. So, Gautam, I mean that's a really good question you asked, and uh, I think uh, it's a question many people have been wondering as well. I personally think uh, some form of hybrid is here to stay. Uh, it's highly unlikely that organizations at large will go back to the way work was done entirely just because there are uh, benefits that both have experienced uh, organizations as well as employees in the kind of flexibility that uh, uh, you know we experienced last year. Uh, so many mental barriers and cultural barriers uh, towards remote work were completely broken last year. And I think uh, there's also this realization that uh, working remotely has many advantages. Most organizations have experienced, uh, you know, unless there was supply constraint or there was, you know, a, a demand issue, they've experienced a rise in productivity. And, you know, whether that's because of uh, the commute time going away or whether it's because 
there has been a greater opportunity for distraction free deep work um there have been uh, so very surprise you know to the surprise of many many organizations uh, productivity gains pretty much across the board so for productivity reasons and the fact that having tasted this flexibility once most employees or many many employees want some combination of uh, you know in office uh, conversational work uh, you know where they do collaboration innovation etc along with some uh, you know space for working remotely so uh, it was a very important question and sam i i understand that all of this is just evolving as we speak and these are conversations which i i am sure across many organizations will be happening over the next several weeks and months that you know what form will the hybrid workplace take in our organization and what sort of implications is that going to have for uh, for you know whether there are any cost savings that get passed on etc right and i think companies are evolving right i mean we are all learning uh, you know there is uh, there is the concept of team a versus team b not everyone going into the office at the same time as you said there is going to be some form of hybrid what works for that particular organization it can't be a one size fits all that everyone moves but there could also be certain roles that will work from home permanently as well so uh, it's again for the organization and uh, for for the organization to decide what will work best for them for best for their productivity Uh, and best from their business uh, perspective so so absolutely yeah. i agree that it's going to be a hybrid uh, and uh, concept uh, sunil thank you for joining us uh, sunil's question is this is in relation to indian it industry people today with 2 to 8 years experience are able to get between 30 to 100% increases and are negotiating 4 to 5 offers sorry 4 to 5 offers any time in this context does wage bill hike mean anything well <laughs> that's a that's a really uh, good question <laughs> i think the whole part about the it industry uh, going um, uh, you know is 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 going uh, very strong uh, it, and and the demand for that skill set is there Uh, is because of this whole work from home you know the skill sets around cloud or python or some of those have really skyrocketed and hence the prices have gone up a lot more because i think again it's the demand and supply the demand of these skill sets are much higher than the supply not to say that it will not catch up right i mean there is always demand that is going to be catching up Uh, to the supply i think the whole conversation that we had that now the whole uh, whole uh, uh, talent market opens up it's not about just bangalore having bangalore it people uh, you know you could be hiring a person in uh, uh, up north uh, for for that job uh, based on the skill set or even out right we could hire it from malaysia why, why only india would be your talent base so that all will drive your cost no in the longer run in the shorter run companies are looking for short term fixes and they will need these talent and hence the uh, job prices uh, are going up in 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 that but i think salary increases and market job are two different concepts right the salary increase we are talking about an annual cycle that is run uh, that that basically tries and manage your inflation as 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 shalini you were talking about or manage in terms of your contribution to the organization uh, and in terms of the affordability market trend and market pricing is very different it's based on what is the what is the value of that job externally uh, in that uh, market so uh, you know you could be um, uh, you know for for your own organization uh you know a, a, an r&d person is going to be really really important but that's not that doesn't mean that the market is paying for that r&d job so there is that internal value of the job and an external value of the job and i think what you were talking about is more of the external value which is very very market driven from a demand and supply side of things so i i do see it again being in hot demand uh, for the for, for in the near future but i think uh, supply uh, will be catching up with the demand 
Uh, Sunil also has another follow-on question. Uh, the assets companies were giving were taken back on exit. What do you think about assets like tables, chairs, etc.? Should these be taken as cost of onboarding? I suppose this has to do with the hybrid model. And wondering if there are any trends emerging on this, Sam. Well, I think we, we, we talked about this. And if I understand this, assets means the desk and the chairs and the you know computer screens and all that. I think many companies have shipped them, have made them available to their employees. Uh, but again, I mean, if, if you say that, okay, this is going to be a hybrid model, will they again have to buy new things so that they can leave it at home? I, I mean, these are again, you know, from an employee and an employer perspective, these are uh, to me a little bit of the finer details, right? It's not that important for, for an employer. You are the one who's most important. It's not the assets that you bring or the company provides. Uh, it's, it's the value that you are giving to that organization and that's the price that the organization values you and pays to you uh, these infrastructure are must to do your business uh, and in every form they will be able to provide that so if they feel that you are you know they need to give you a a, a screen at home and at at work i think they'll work that out i'm not I'm, i don't think that is uh, really uh, the 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 minute details are not not to be stressed over is what i would feel but Sam, is this a conversation? Like, uh, have you heard, you know, you obviously work with so many organizations. Have you heard this as a conversation as yet? That how do we navigate some of this that in a hybrid model, if you have, say, chairs and tables at home, uh, screen at home, it is, it, it has that started? I mean, it may still be early, so it'll be perfectly fine. It, it is you definitely, don't know. definitely early, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, yes, companies obviously uh, are gearing towards it. So it's not that they haven't. They've always had uh, a lot more assets than they've required. So I think they will definitely be making the best use out of that asset pool. Uh, if those cost of assets and providing those hybrid models uh, increases, then of course uh, they will need to make sure that their revenues are increasing by multifold. Uh, yeah. to compensate for that. So I, I think companies would be uh, looking at from all aspects uh, that, uh, that, that you know, how they, they can better equip the employees to be the most productive selves. So uh, again, I, I think those conversations are happening, uh, you know, between HR admin and finance, and they are very smart people. And, you know, these things will be figured out based on uh, based on how the impact would be to the overall PNL of the organization. Got it. So, I, I mean, I, this year is going to be such an interesting year because as things go back, uh, you know, many, many new conversations are happening across organizations as they're trying to figure out many of the kinds of questions which, you know, many of our viewers are, themselves are asking, like, what's going to be the impact of all of this? On compensation what's going to be the impact of all of this on the infrastructure that will be provided what's going to be the impact of all of this on the way demand and supply of talent changes and therefore the market prices change and you know as you spoke about that's going to be a key driver as well so let me go back to a point you uh, brought up sam just before uh, you know we read some of those questions so that was around personalization we've seen that a huge trend this last year has been this conversation around personalization of employee experience and uh, while it's still uh, a conversation that's you know evolving and emerging every day i uh, would love to have your thoughts around what does personalization mean in the context of compensation yeah i, I mean it's it's again a concept that has been there for a while uh, you know i i, I think um, uh, personalization of compensation means can you structure my compensation the way I would like uh, based on where I am in my employee life cycle in my uh, life uh, cycle in general right if I'm a 20 year old some someone who's just uh, looking to uh, you know pay off my rent and uh, have a decent lifestyle and then have savings you know, I may want to look at it, you know, a higher fixed or a lower variable or a combination of that versus someone who's in the 30s who have, uh, you know, starting maybe kids or family, they need a much more higher component of fixed than the variable. Uh, and then, of course, your life insurances, your policies, your 
uh, uh, everything changes from that perspective. So personalization to me is choices. Can can I make the choices that works with my lifestyle uh, around the compensation? Now it's much easier said than it's a it's a it's a nightmare for rewards and HR to run such an exercise uh, and to be able to cater. To them. Technology has progressed quite a lot, uh, but to sum up everything have different variable pay plans, have different long-term incentive plans, have different uh, base salary structures. It is it is very different. And then the whole concept about that if uh, two people uh, who are pretty much in the same um, zone, they have very different lifestyles as well. You know, some may want to support their parents and hence need a higher pay versus some may not. So, uh, you know, in, in reality, it's the choices that you, you know, can companies make those choices for you. Um, but but I think the personalization is still a little bit far off in the future. It will we will get there. I'm pretty sure technology will get us there. But right now it's about segmentizing a particular workforce into a uh, you know into a kind of a persona as we say uh, in design thinking where you could say okay this is the persona of an ideal employee in the 20s and can we structure the rewards according to that. And this is a persona of someone in 30s and someone in 40s and 50s and so on and so forth. So I think companies are starting with that journey uh, and then we'll move into the journey of hyper personalization where the choice can be for you. No, I think that's very well said, Sam. We had a similar conversation on what personalization of employee experience will look like uh, a few couple of months back. And uh, that was uh, also the experience of uh, our guests that uh, a lot of our conversation at this point, where we are today, has been around segmentation and looking at uh, differences in needs of different segments of our workforce. But where we are headed, and this is uh, you know, going to be something that's going to be greatly enabled both by data uh, and by technology coming together, is the hyper-personalization, where there is the opportunity for, uh, you know, everyone's individual differences to be recognized and compensation and many other aspects of the employee experience getting designed right according to that. So let me come back to the uh, conversation, uh, Sam, around the future of compensation itself. Uh, we've seen that uh, performance management over the last, uh, I would say, about five-ish years in particular, has uh, you know had this huge debate around should we have ratings should we not have ratings many many organizations have uh, experimented with doing away with you know one rating and having either a number of different ratings or a more qualitative description of the contribution that you have made etc so there's been even in the performance management space for instance this move towards personalization uh, but what I want to ask you is this, uh, the other counter view that we've heard uh, and equally so in fact, is the challenge that when you do away with performance management ratings, how do you work with rewards? Uh, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are around what you've been seeing organizations do. Well, I mean, that's a definitely a tough, tough one. Like, as you said, you know, there is um, both sides to the coin. Uh, I we have definitely seen a lot of organizations move to this rating yes. aspect of performance, um, where you would be uh, looking at from a perspective that uh, companies are uh, not going to be rating employees, and uh, yeah. you know it's about the contribution that you have made to the organization. Uh, you know you could have a lot of high performing people. Uh, and then uh, how do you then reward them? You know, I, I think for smaller organizations, it's easier to do uh, in terms of the administration of this uh, versus some of the larger organizations. The larger organizations, the budgets are very complex. Uh, you know, you have a budget by the organization level, the business unit levels, yeah. you know, at the team levels. Uh, and it's very hard to distribute that if everyone feels that we have performed to the best. And I think performance is also very subjective uh, from a manager's perspective, from an individual's perspective, uh, and it is very hard to administer. So 
large organizations who have gone into some of this rating less conversations that I, 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 I do see on the compensation side, they will still form kind of a bell curve uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, the performance is rewarded accordingly, because in, in an ideal organization, you would have some laggers, some really super performers. And uh, in, 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 a, uh, in a ratingless environment, uh, sometimes uh, mediocrity actually wins. Uh, and, uh, and that is what you need to be very careful about because um, uh, everyone feels they're a high performer. Uh, everyone is uh, feeling that, but you know, you're, and you're not able to differentiate that with rewards. The whole big role of rewards is to be able to differentiate. Uh, it's, it's, it's a carrot and stick approach, right? You want the, your high performers to always be there. Not to say that your average performers are not important. They are, they are equally important because that's the bulk of the organization. Uh, but those super performers are the ones who get you the highest returns. And this whole concept about uh, getting the maximum uh, return on your compensation spend is going to be uh, a, a concept that organizations are going to be looking at in the future. Because for, for a lot of organizations, especially in the services sector, compensation is one of their biggest costs. Uh, and are they getting that? And, and, and since you talk a lot about the future of work, I also want to bring in this concept about the future of work where we are talking about a lot of jobs getting automated or getting augmented with freelancers or uh, through the technology tools, right? So I think in the future, organizations are also going to start thinking about are these jobs going to get, uh, get more impacted from technology and are going to be distributing their compensation spend to say, right, you know, an, an, an accountant, for example, you know, the technology may be able to do a lot better job in the future. And if we are not adding more skill sets to the accountant or not adding a lot more job, role to it, why would I want to pay, uh, pay him or her a lot more than, um, than I would want to pay for a cloud engineer who's very evolving and it's very hard to repl replicate or, uh, you know, a creative designer who's very hard to kind of re replicate in this future of work environment. So I think for, from, from, from our perspective, you know, as we are a lot more analytical thinkers in India, generally, we need to be very careful of bringing that creativity aspect to our jobs uh, and also having this whole mindset about uh, skill building and, and skilling ourselves continuously to be uh, with this uh, future of work. Sam, so on that point, I want to understand what you think about, uh, do you see in the future of compensation, Pay for skills becoming an increasingly important trend. Um, I think absolutely, and in fact, we are already seeing that have an impact. So, uh, you know, we uh, have uh, in in a key markets uh, started this tool called Skills View, and what it does is it actually uh, looks at the impact of pay on skills. Uh, and what 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 happens is, especially this is very true in technology industry. And I think we were talking about that IT industry and all of that. Uh, the skills are changing very rapidly. So although the companies are giving a 30% increase today, but that skill might go away in the next two years. And these people, if they are not constantly skilling on the next technology, a big of a problem. Also, I think skills are also about, uh, you know, it's not that, you know, today I have a, a workday skill and I add another skill and I, so it's not like I keep getting a 10% increase on every skill that I add. So, uh, you know, it, it is about how the impact of pay is and how I can build that whole skills library within my organization. A lot of companies today don't know the skill set of their people uh, because we were never able to capture that. You know, I think IT companies have done a fantastic job of it now. But most organizations don't have a skill library in place uh, for their employees and to know what skill sets do they bring. There is also the whole concept about, you know, you have skills and then you have industry knowledge, right? Uh, I always give this example about uh, admin assistant in a financial services industry. You always, when you look at the job description, nine out of 10 times that job posting will have should have worked in financial services yeah. before. Uh, but an admin assistant, I mean, if you look at the core skill sets, 
is project management is a lot to do with uh, administration management is 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 uh, is to organize is to do all that so you can take all these skills but the role itself requires that industry uh, nature as well so i don't think we are moving into that as fast uh, from a skills perspective that companies will start saying okay you have project management skills you have this now you can do compensation right because those are the core skill set but in technology you can do that uh, you have the c python you have you have this new skill set uh, yes because there is not enough people i will give you uh, you know you can come and work in the bank and i will teach you how the banking industry works but 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 i'll give you that premium so on the technology side the skills is definitely coming in and are getting that uh, pay but i think on the broader sense um, it will still take a little bit more time i would feel uh, uh, since we start getting into that whole approach of industry agnostic and thinking about it from a perspective that true skill sets could lead to uh, a true job and we break the job down into skills right right now actually there's some very interesting trends colliding here because on the one hand there's pay for skills starting with technology because obviously there we're seeing the maximum uh you know challenge in terms of supply and demand of skills in particular along with the trend to focus on the outcomes you know what is it that you can deliver you know at the end and uh, that becoming uh, particularly in a hybrid kind of work or what we have experienced through this last year your outcomes becoming you know far far more important than they were in years so so there's it's, it's going to be very interesting i know that 21 is such a fluid year it's a year where many of these trends will we'll see how they integrate and i know it's a conversation which is actually evolving every day so it's super interesting so i want to take a couple of questions more i realize we are coming to the end of our time uh got them again uh sam mentioned that employers have done a great job of non monetary rewards such as mental health support managing finances etc sam also mentioned that this has led to employee retention which may not stay that way because of employee short term memories my views are one employee retention may have been high because organizations were shedding rather than hiring two monetary awards will always be a significant component of value from an employee's perspective and three the next gen will inevitably i think it sort of drops off there so i i, I think so too gotham i think uh, uh, last year was a very unusual year uh, in many ways uh, it was a year when uh i think hiring was uh, lower than it has been in past years and people were uh sticking on with jobs unless there was a very clear reason to move on so so that might be short term and uh, absolutely i think monetary awards will always be significant but i also understand what sam spoke about that the whole in the total rewards philosophy itself it's about emphasizing the totality of it and then you know individuals sort of see compensation as one part of it and as we spoke about in the conversation around personalization maybe for uh, some employees it's all about your net cash take home and then for other employees maybe there are other factors of this total rewards philosophy that might be you know far more relevant um so with that uh, sam i want to ask you for your final thoughts around where the future of compensation is headed so uh, i think uh, you know like gotham said like 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 you said i think uh, future is definitely going to be more personalization it's 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 the choices i can make uh, it's uh, definitely not a one size fits all approach uh, it is about being aware of uh, affordability and company dynamics you know i think a lot of employees do forget that you know you run for a profit center and if the company is not making money it's very hard to pay you uh salaries or it's very hard to retain you but yes as employees you have a choice and uh, you can stick by uh, or you can leave yes that is definitely there um i think the skills component is going to definitely be uh, a lot more in the future uh, i think the whole concept about virtual hr virtual compensation is going to be a lot more future i think one point we never touched on which i think is very important is really this protection of employee data Uh, i think as compensation professionals we work a lot with uh, really confidential uh, data day in day out especially during these 
uh, times of performance management and review cycles. Mm -hmm. And in this virtual environment, all this data gets uh, shared in Excel. And I think we definitely need to use tools where they can secure this data. I do see that uh, you know privacy becoming a big thing uh, in India in the future and protecting this data is going to be critical. Thank you. So really well summarized. I, I will add to that that we will be seeing some very interesting conversations around uh, you know, how the future of the workplace, the hybrid model is going to impact the talent market itself. So if organizations actually start thinking about talent more broadly than they have in the past, and that opens out possibilities of hiring, which now we know is possible, people who are outside, and at the same time, employees, particularly those who are uh, who have skills that are, uh, you know, uh, in, in in great demand, having the possibility of working with many, many more employees than they traditionally had. So that would be an interesting trend colliding. I understand it's an extremely interesting space and one which is uh, going to see many, many new trends and many, many new evolutions through 2021. So with that, Sam, we come to an end of our conversation today. Uh, really, thank you so much for coming and giving us your time and sharing so many of your ideas around what you're seeing all around. Super helpful, super helpful for all of us uh, and all of those who are watching us and understanding where we are in 2021. I'm sure next year at the same time, we, it would be really interesting to revisit many of our predictions and see which of these actually panned out the way we had thought to. And I'm sure there'll be some similarities and many things different, but we're at such an interesting, you know, fluid space. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Shalini. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Sam. So with that, we come to an end of our show today. Uh, if you're interested in the future of work as a subject, uh, do take a look at the 28 other episodes we've done on the future of work. You're sure to find many that match your own curiosity. Uh, Uncube works as an educator and advisor in the area of future of work. So if that's an area that you or your organization are interested in, reach out to me, uh, Papia, or Jaspreet, and we'll be very happy to work with you. With that, thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of the day and a great weekend, and see you next time.